The after dinner slot. The after dinner slot, it's, uh, it's always a difficult one, isn't it? You know, uh, especially when we've had such an amazing morning with, with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I think, I, think, uh, I think what Jeremy Corbyn had to say was absolutely incredible this morning. It's going to make a difference to lots and lots of people's lives. And the sooner we can get him in, the, the better. Uh, but conference, uh, firstly, obviously, can I welcome you to our 100th uh, national conference. And obviously, this is, this is a significant year. Um, I mean, a lot of people will be wondering why. Why is it that this is only our 100th uh, national conference when we've been around since 1847? Well, just to, just to clarify, there are a number of reasons uh, why this is our 100th conference, and, and obviously not dating all the way back to, to 1847, because when we originally started, we were based uh, very much on regions. Uh, so our organisation used to organise on a regional basis. And then we, then we started to organise on a, on a sort of a national basis. So we had a conference in England and Scotland and Wales. And then in 1914, uh, the Boot and Shoe Trade Hall uh, in Leicester. Uh, by this time, we was known as the Amalgamated Union of Operative Bakers and Confectioners of Great Britain and Ireland was when we held uh, our first national conference because that was the first time the Scottish delegation of the operative bakers joined that conference. But it was also a very significant conference too because not only was the General Secretary uh, at that time uh, someone referred to as the General retiring, it was also at the backdrop of a, of a big fear that there was going on uh, within the, well, actually, oh, actually across the country, which was, which was the fear of war. And at that particular time, uh, the conference agenda included a motion from the Executive Council expressing concerns over the prospects of a European war. The, mo the motion called on the government to do all it could by legitimate means to, to bring about peace. The motion concluded with Brother Emery st stating that workers would eventually realise that they were the greatest sufferers of war. It was also a significant conference because of a motion that was brought by Brother Ferris, and it read simply, admission of unskilled labor to the union. There had been some strong debates that took place at that conference on whether or not another organization should represent unskilled workers whilst the union concentrated on its own skilled members. Brother Ferris pointed out to the union that the union shouldn't ask for its responsibilities to unschooled, unorganised workers, and it shouldn't shirk its responsibility to organise those workers. He stated that it should be the work of our union to organise and fight for them, rather than to go cap in hand looking for to support from other trade unions who may have organised them at our time of need and struggle. And in second in the motion, Brother Fletcher said that the time for mere craft union organisation had gone by and they had to recognise that this was now a class fight and they needed to stand alongside the skilled and the unskilled labour or workmen. That is a significant change because I tell you now, if it hadn't been for those motions, our union today would not exist. So those pioneers at that 1914 conference are the reasons why we are here today to celebrate our 100th conference, and to them we owe a debt of gratitude. Also, a significant motion at that particular conference, alongside moving from being an organisation that's organised around craft to organising around class, was another motion. It didn't invoke great debate. There was shouts from the floor of get on with it, and that was to admit women into our trade union. So in 1914, women actually, for the first time, became full bakers food and, well, obviously, operative bakers union members then. And by 2000, uh, 1916, we had 2,000 women in our union, and most of those were in all women branches. So again, you know, we think, you know, we recognize that again, we were probably pioneering the trade union movement at that time and giving access to women who not until a few years later were let into most other trade unions. So again, our union at the forefront of real change. And whilst we talk about the past and to look at securing dignity, 
and decent pay and conditions. I want to also congratulate, because I think it's also important, as we, well as we recognise and celebrate those people, those pioneers of our history, we recognise and celebrate the achievements of some of our people today. And I want to congratulate, and I know sometimes change is very, very difficult, but I want to congratulate the Warburton's branch secretaries for the work that they've done in making di difficult changes and going through difficult negotiations to set a new bar in our industry when it comes to pay, when it comes to holidays, and when it comes to certain conditions of employment. I think it's our job now in this industry to raise all of our pay to the level that they've just negotiated. And I want to congratulate every single one of those branch secretaries because our members, you know, when we're given an opportunity to vote on what they achieved, voted by over 70% to accept those changes. Those are great people and I think we owe them a, a debt of thanks for what they've just done on behalf of those workers that now makes their lives so much better. And of course, and of course, obviously since, since we met last year, our union, our union created history. It created history by making an historic link with unorganized workers, workers who it was claimed couldn't be organized, workers who it was claimed were happy to be working in a, for a corporation, an organization that offered them very little, that offered them exploitative contracts, that offered them low pay. They apparently were quite happy to continue with that. But yet, yet what we found last year was we found people on zero hours contracts people on less minimum wage because it was related to their age than what people would expect to see as a decent standard of living, actually make a bold decision. A bold decision that was based after meeting them. Because right, I had the, I had the fortune, fortunality to go and meet these workers uh, in a pub in London to listen to their stories about why they had decided that they were one, joining our trade union and two, going to take on the biggest corporation in the world. Stories such as the young woman who was abused in her workplace after coming out of an abusive relationship, a young woman who was told by her manager and shouted at by her manager even though he knew that she'd suffered with mental illness, suffered with depression, and suffered to get out of an abusive relationship, but yet he thought it was quite fun to shout an abuser in the workplace. I heard another story about somebody who suffered from mental illness that was abused by customers, young people that came into that shop. And those people that used to abuse her, instead of being told not to do it, the young woman who was taking the abuse was told by the manager, it's just something that she would have to accept. I read, as many people would have read, but I met the young man who told the same story by Chadid Adjici Chakrabarti, who wrote about a young worker who brought home to me what it means to be a young person on a zero-hours contract in low pay. The idea that our young people are now sofa surfing because they can't afford the rent. This was a young man, by the way, a young man that was working 40 hours a week Working 40 hours a week, he couldn't live at home, he had to leave. And he had to go and find a flat, which he did, and he had a job to pay for it. But because the manager that came in decided he didn't like him, because he was on a zero-hours contract, he reduced his hours from 40 to 8. So of course, what that means is it wasn't long before he didn't have enough money to pay for his rent. He didn't have enough money to survive in that flat. So it didn't take long before he lost his home and found himself reliant just on his workmates, on his friends, on their family to find him a place to live. He was living in a car when he was actually interviewed by Dietrich Chakrabarti, 17 year old, sofa surfing. And that's why when I met them in this pub and people said, I'm joining the union, because I think, I think it's wrong that I can't afford to buy my child, you know, the football boots or the trainers that they require, the school uniform that gives them the same equality of standing as the child that they sit next to in school. 
I think it's wrong when I go out to work and work all the hours I do that I can't afford to match and make them feel comfortable in their work, you know, when they go to school or, you know, to afford even to pay the rent. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to take action because I think it's wrong that this young lad called Tyrone is living on somebody's couch. I think it's wrong that a manager thinks it's okay to abuse a young woman with mental illness. I think it's wrong to abuse, you know, someone with men, you know, who's suffered from mental ill health. And what we're going to do is we're going to form a union and we're going to send the clearest message to this corporation that we're refusing to accept our oppression, that we're refusing to accept that we have to live like this. We're refusing to accept that we have to have low pay. We're refusing to accept that we have to have zero hour contracts. And they decided, they decided on the 4th of September that they would go on strike and make history, make history. What an incredibly brave thing to do with people with no contracts of employment, with no rights, with no security. But they did it, they did it, and they did it for us and for everybody else that works in this industry, for everybody, for everybody on a zero hours contract. And you know what? Because people tell us, don't they? You can't win. You've got to accept it. It's the way it is. But you know what? When they announced the strike, McDonald's announced the rollout of contracts of employment. They've turned out to be a sham, but it demonstrated they had to respond. But you know what? It didn't stop there because the two managers that were abusing and bullying people in those shops, they got sacked. Quite rightly so. Quite rightly so. Power to the workers at McDonald's. And then, and then, striking doesn't work. Striking doesn't work, they tell us. You can't fight back. The biggest ever pay rise McDonald's have ever received, 6.5% awarded in January because of the work and because of their bravery. That's the reason why McDonald's gave them 6.5%. So let's be clear. Let's be clear when they tell us that we can't win, we know we can. And let's, let's also be clear. In your workplace, when they want to oppress you, you stand together and you demonstrate to them that we are not afraid. That we will not stand by and allow them to oppress us any longer. The time for change is here. The time for change must be taken. Take your inspiration from one another. Listen to what Jeremy Corbyn says. You don't have to wait for a Labour government. We should never have to wait for politicians to make the changes that we deserve. As food workers, as people who work in this industry, we deserve the best. And our job is to go out and secure that best. Now, obviously, in my opening speech, I also like to do a little bit of international stuff. I mean, I think it's so much going on in the world. There's absolutely so much going on in the world. There's the mass murders of people in Yemen, the civil war in Syria, the tragedy which is Gaza, Gaza an American bloated racist in the White House uh, who thinks some racists are good people, a Tory government riddled with Islamophobia, its decision to deport the Windrush generation are examples of how far politics in the UK has become detached from reality. And let me tell you this, from this conference I'm sure we'll all agree, you don't build countries on the back of racism, you build them on, on, build them on, injusti on justice, equality and for freedom. And that's what we stand for as a trade union. And let's also be clear, because we've read about this and we've seen an awful lot of it in the paper, it is not anti-Semitic to say that the cold-blooded murder of Palestinian men, women and children at the, Israel, at the hands of the Israeli army is not anti-Semitic. It's a fact, you know. And the lack of condemnation by the mainstream media and a good number of UK politicians betrays a complete imbalance when it comes to the handling of world affairs. Had this been President Assad in Syria, MPs would have descended to the House of Commons, foaming at the mouth, shouting and screaming for airstrikes. However, the blood of some people, quite clearly, is worth considerably less 
than the blood of others, when lucrative arms sales, when religion and suspect international allegiances are concerned, using sniper fire, drones and white phosphorus gas against protesters armed with nothing other than, than rocks, catapults and tennis rackets will never be a good look in any democracy worthy of the title. The Israeli government must be condemned it must be held to account in exactly the same way as any other country that commits such atrocities. There will be times we are powerless to fight injustice, but there will never be a time when we should accept we don't have the right to protest. We should never be afraid to speak out and we should never accept the murder of any people, no matter who they are, as justifiable. Now there are also, there are also Lots of anniversaries this year. The TUC's 150th, the representation of the People's Act that allowed women over the age of 30 the right to vote for equal franchise under the Franchise Act, which then came in in 1928, which brought the right for women and men to vote at the same age. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement, the only civil rights movement ever in the UK. The Dagenham dispute, and of course, 40 years since the national bread strike. But unfortunately, unfortunately this week we'll also have another anniversary of the tragedy that is Grenfell. I'm sure our hearts and best wishes go out to the families of the dead and to the survivors, an event that didn't need to happen. But in a society, in a society where decisions of value, not of life, are more important to those who are elected to represent us, to maintain our, our basic human rights to life, this tragedy was always likely to happen. And the shocking facts that this Tory government has failed to house these survivors after nearly a year speaks volumes about them and why we need real change in our society. The rampant racism in our media the and the Tory party means our society is divided. But let's be clear, the hardship that we are suffering is not caused by anybody born outside of the UK. It's created in cabinet offices and boardrooms of corporations that introduced zero-hour contracts like McDonald's and to avoid their paying their tax and their contributions to our economy. It's cabinet offices that enable bosses and employers to act without regard to people's working rights. So let's be clear, it wasn't a migrant that came in this country that sold off the council houses, that was a political decision. And the fact that nobody bothered to build council houses, and that's the reason why people struggle to find a decent home. Put the blame where it belongs. They never, ever should be putting the blame on people who only want to come and improve their lives in our country. And you know, when you talk about freedom of movement, and I know the debate about the EU, and of course there will be stuff here about the EU, and people will say it's justifiable, we need to stay in the European Union so we can have freedom of movement. Why should your freedoms depend on whether or not we have a trade deal with somebody? What is wrong with the human right of freedom? Because you know, if you're wealthy, if you're powerful, you can live wherever you want in the world. This is a class issue. This is about stopping us from being able to prosper. This is about control. It's never been about our freedoms. Our freedom is our human right to exist and to live wherever we feel will benefit us the most and our families. And that is our right as a human being, regardless of where you're born. And you know what? When we talk about people seeking asylum, they are not asylum seekers. They are human beings looking for sanctuary in our country because they're escaping persecution and a refugee. A refugee, let's be clear on a refugee, as Joe said this morning. If you don't want refugees living here, stop bombing the shit out of countries and I'll go to standing orders after, you know? Because if you don't bomb the countries, you don't create them. And refugees should always, always be welcome here. We stand in solidarity with our comrades at TGI, we stand in solidarity with those people who were protesting on the streets yesterday. We stand in solidarity with those health service workers that are on strike uh, over in Wigan. We stand in solidarity with all working class communities. We stand in solidarity because we know, 
We all deserve a better life, not based on your wealth or your ability to be born in the right family, but on our right as human beings. And this week at the conference, you're going to debate a number of motions. I hope, I really do hope, all these first-time delegates really enjoy this week and the celebrations. But when we go back, after we've finished at the end of this week, take this message to all of our members. We have to stand up and we have to fight because if we're going to change not just our workplaces but our communities, we have to stand together in solidarity. Solidarity. Thank you.